So Luke chapter 18, at the beginning of verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? To some who were confident in the, of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, we, um, let's, let's pray, shall we? So it's good to help us with this. Father, we thank you, Lord, um, that um, as we gather you uh, here in our midst, Lord, we pray um, that as we open your word and look at this text, uh, that you'd give me clarity of thought and speech, but also you'll give us listening ears. And that, Lord, that we wouldn't hear from me, but we would hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Please keep your Bibles open. On, uh, on, if it's a church Bible, it's uh, 10.52. Um, if you're following on your phone, it's uh, Luke chapter 18, uh, verses 1 to 14. And we're continuing our series on living as kingdom-building disciples. And if I had a question for the text this morning... It would be, how is God building his kingdom in a world that is hostile to him? Well, the two parables or illustrations that Jesus gives us at the beginning of uh, Luke 18 shows us that prayer is awesome and is an amazing privilege and an absolute essential to God's building plan. Um, and that, this passage flows from the previous passage, which is chapter 17, verses 20 to 37, where Jesus is asked, when will your kingdom come? And Jesus replies in his, uh, to uh, the question and says that his kingdom in its coming will be like the days of Noah and like the days of Lot. In short, it will be a time where people turn their backs on the Lord, God their creator, and do their own thing. It will be a time of social chaos and confusion where people seem to confidently live with no guarantee of tomorrow. It'd be a time where mankind lives ignorantly or even deliberately in rebellion to God, a hostile time towards God. And as uh, believers or following those that follow Jesus, it's hard not to be challenged, isn't it, by the world around us. When we um, look at uh, distressing images coming out of Ukraine and other war-torn parts of the world, or a, a global pandemic that's uh, ongoing and still a threat, or if it's just violence on our streets, or even a, a spiralling global climate, or even the chaos that we see in our political systems, even across the world. These are challenging times, aren't they? Or maybe it's a bit closer to home. The challenges are concerns with our own personal finances, or health issues, or problems with family members, or even battling addictions, or sin. The world needs King Jesus, doesn't it? And it needs his kingdom for sure. 
So how is God building his kingdom in a world that is hostile to him? We'll see in our text that it's through persistent prayer and humble dependency on his justice and his mercy. And that what we're to do is to not give up, never give up, but to pray for God's righteous rule. So God builds his kingdom, my first point, is through people that are prayerfully dependent on him. And you'll see that in your Bibles in verses, chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. In verse 1, Jesus instructs his disciples that they should always pray and never give up. And he illustrates this with the story of a persistent widow and an unjust judge. Let's read it then from verse 2. It says, He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared for people. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. And the judge in verse 4 refuses to help her for some time. It doesn't say how long. Could have been months. Could have been years. But he refuses to help her. But she keeps going to him again and again and again. And why does she do this? It's because almost 2,000 years ago, uh, the Israelite society was a patriarchal society where women had no status or power outside of their husbands, fathers, or brothers. And so when it came to dealing with her adversary, her oppressor, this lady had no power. She had no authority. She's powerless. So why does she keep coming to the judge? Because the judge has status. The judge has power and authority to deal with her enemy. Look at verse 5. She comes to him with such intensity and determination that she makes the judge worried about his own well-being. So much so that he is moved to move on her behalf and deal with her enemy. And this presents us with a wonderful picture of prayer, doesn't it? This uh, widow woman, in dealing with her enemy, is very much like us in dealing with our enemy. And the Bible tells us our true struggle is not with flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. In short, our enemy is sin and sin's champion, the devil, who is the driving force behind the hostility towards God in this world. Now that may seem strange to hear that in an Anglican church, but it's true. And we, like the uh, widow woman, in our own human capacity, our own power and strength, have no status or power or authority to overcome sin and sin's champion on our own. He can't be dealt with intellectually or with job titles or with uh, an excellent performance or with money or even just by coming to church. Our enemy is dealt with by being prayerfully dependent on the Lord. And why is this? Because the judge that we approach in prayer is unlike the judge in our parable. He is a just God and a caring God. But he is the ultimate judge. And there simply is no one like him. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is without beginning or end. That means you, there isn't a time that you can go to where he, you can find that he wasn't can't go back far enough. You can't go to a time when he'll be out of office because he always shall be. You can't write his boss because there isn't anybody higher than him. And he certainly can't find anybody to outmuscle God because he is the Lord God Almighty. And there is no one that can outmuscle him. In short, there is no, no thing or no one that can stand before him. Or against him. And here Jesus is telling us that like the widow woman lent on the unjust judge, we are to lean on the Lord in prayer and depend on his status and his power and his authority to deal with an enemy that we can't deal with. 
but it was well under his foot and our feet as we pray and st- pray with the Lord. We pray for his justice, and as we pray for his righteous rule, and we pray for his kingdom to come, God will move on our behalf in our world and in the world around us. Look with me at verse 7. Verse 7 says, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him on some occasions? Let's say that in the Bible there. Oh, sorry, I might have got that wrong. Who cry out to him sometimes. No, the Bible says, who call out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will, they will get justice and quickly. Notice that those that pray for God's justice, for his righteous rule, they will move God to act on their behalf in their lives and in the world around them. Isn't that wonderful? A wonderful privilege of prayer that you in your strength and your human capacity cannot deal with the real issues. But through prayer, you are leaning on the very authority and power of God to move on our behalf. That's a wonderful gift that God has given his people. But we struggle, don't we, to pray day and night. We often struggle to find time to pray in our personal lives. We sometimes prioritize other things. Struggle to come out to our prayer meetings, connect to and to pray, even with life groups where we know we can pray with others. That doesn't become a priority when when this awesome facility is available for us. And even, and this is no pressure, don't be angry with me, but even some of us here are carrying burdens and challenges that are just beyond us. And at the end of the service, there will be a prayer team here, even I'll be here, but we'll struggle to come to the front and ask for prayer. I read a quote in uh, Tim Keller's helpful book on prayer, which says, prayer, though is often draining, even, ag- even an agony, is in the long term the greatest source of power that is possible. So as we navigate our way through this hostile world, challenged with challenges and faced with problems that may seem impossible for us, and they are impossible for us in our human capacity. Jesus is instructing us to pray and to pray always, day and night and never give up. And if I was to take a mic and was to roam it around here, for those of us that have been Christians for any while, there will be tons of testimonies of how God answers prayer. How God is even not only just able to answer prayer, but he also does exceedingly above what we could even ask or think. Really need to up our game with prayer and become more persistent and make a commitment for that. God's kingdom is built on a foundation of prayer. And the more we persist, the more God's power will move in our lives and in the world around us. Which brings to my second point. God's kingdom is built through humble prayer, dependency on God, his mercy and not performance. So it's prayer dependency on his mercy and not performance. And the next parable, which is in verses 9 to 14 in your Bible, continues the theme of prayer. And in verse 9, Jesus tells his disciples not to be confident in your own righteousness and look out for others, or look down on others. Look out for others, but don't look down on others. And here Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Visiting the Jerusalem temple for prayer. The Pharisee, being a man of power and position, well connected, educated, family seemed to be in check and in order, at least on the surface, respected in the community, has a public profile as somebody who does things right, at least on the surface. 
the sort of person that wouldn't find it too difficult to engage here or be engaged with over coffee after service. And we probably would target him to be on our church rotors, fill some of the gaps, isn't it, Harry, that we've got? But on the other hand, the tax collector is despised, hated, considered to be the bane of society, a swindler, a, a Roman collaborator, someone that has a lot of money and makes a lot of money, but it doesn't matter and doesn't care who he crushes to get it. He has the moral compass of a drug dealer. And you can see that as he parks his donkey in the temple car park or donkey park, onlookers looking at him and saying, what's he doing here? I guess if you had a, you know, if your daughter came home and said she had a choice of marrying either of these or a friend of yours, you're probably, I think the majority of us would push her towards the Pharisee, wouldn't we? But in our second parable, God sees things differently. So let's read from verses 11. So the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you, <laughs> not, like, not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. On the other hand, verse 13, the tax collector stood at a distance, the Bible tells us. And he would not even look up at heaven, but beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, the parable of the widow and unjust judge showed us that we have no power or capacity to deal with our own sin in our own strength and overcome it. And here we see that no one has the capacity to perform a righteousness that is acceptable to God. I mean, the Bible says that our righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. I mean, God simply isn't interested in our CVs, our LinkedIn profiles, or our religious activities, or even positions that we hold inside or outside the church. He's not interested in anything that we can boast about. His kingdom is built through repentant sinners who know they need God's mercy. No matter whether you are a prostitute or an accountant, whether you're a millionaire or on universal service, universal credit. We all need mercy and to turn away from sin and pray and thank God for his mercy. And in verse 14, you'll see the tax collector goes home justified, justified in God's eyes. The outcast, the wrong one, has been made right as he recognizes his sinfulness before God and recognizes that his only hope is repentance and to rely on God's mercy. And as we pray today, and as we pray day and night for God's justice, and we turn from our sin and receive God's mercy, God's kingdom is built amongst us and is a present reality, but also a future hope. A present reality because God's justice has already been served to destroy sin and its champion, the devil, and to deal with our enemy through the work of the cross. And God's mercy is available now for anybody who will turn their back on sin and ask God for forgiveness. I want to read you a um, couple of verses from Colossians. Don't you turn there, but you want to make a note if you want to read it yourself. Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. Listen, what's it, listen to what it says about God's justice. It says, Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has turned it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross and by the cross. Jesus, God's justice, has destroyed our enemies through the cross. Listen to what Ephesians says about God's mercy. It says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, 
made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. And by grace, you have been saved. God's justice and God's mercy is what we lean on in prayer. So in closing, if you are listening to this this morning, whether you're in the church or on live stream, and you have not yet received the Lord Jesus, we just read here that God, who is a just judge, has already moved with great power and authority to offer deliverance from sin and its champion, victory over its champion. And all you need to do and all we need is a simple prayer, just like the tax collector. We can do that this morning. A prayer to receive or turn from sin, ask God for his mercy and receive Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And we'd be happy to do that today, start you on your new journey. We'll have uh, people that will be praying at the front of the church. Um, there's people wearing lanyards, there's me. Want to grab one of us, be happy to pray with you and start you on that journey. And for those of us who have come to Christ, um, know his justice, then there's a call here to up our game. When you think of what God is offering in prayer, an ability outside of our own that we can't match, a force against our enemy that we don't possess. But in prayer, God is offering us to lean on his status, his power and authority to deal with our enemy and to pray with the intensity of the widow woman and with the humility of the tax or repentance tax collector that we just read about. And although we are in this world that is hostile and surrounded by challenges, many of which seem impossible, don't they? When you, when you switch the news on just in the evening, it's impossible situations. When you consider the, the uh, state of the... Uh, of how we live, when you look at some of the crazy gun crimes and things that have seemed beyond our control and impossible. Well, Jesus is calling us to pray and always pray and not give up. Pray for his righteous rule and his justice and not give up. He's calling us to pray, not sometimes, not to have it low on our list, but to pray day and night so that he will move and act on our behalf. And I think 18, chapter 18, verse 8, B, is worth noting. It says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And the expectation of the Lord here for us who follow Jesus, his disciples, to faithfully pray and never give up, and also to await for his return and the dawning of his new creation. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for your goodness to us. That Lord, where we are living in a world where things just seem impossible and difficult and hard and challenging, whether that's uh, just generally how the world works or whether that is issues that we are confronted with in our own personal space. Lord, we know that our enemy is not flesh and blood but we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickednesses that we need your power that you make available to us in prayer Lord I pray that you help us to be a praying church and a praying people that rely on your power and your mercy help us to come humbly 
and remember, Lord, the great price that you paid for us, that we might turn from our sin and find mercy at the foot of your throne. Help us, Lord, to remember this. In Jesus' name, amen.